Namaste, my dear sisters and brothers. The love and blessings of the Mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. To today's topic, the male reproductive system. Man is uh, more than a feeding and breeding animal. And therefore, although sex is one of those uh, instincts with which we are heavily overloaded, in order to accommodate the unique aspirations of man, and there is uh, quite a bit of uh, mystique as well as uh, considerations, legal, social, moral, ethical, religious, and spiritual that have been attached to it. And that has been possible uh, in biological terms because of a great degree of encephalization of the human being. That is, our brain is... Uh, much more complex, much better developed, and particularly the thinking part of the brain, the cerebral cortex, is uh, enormously bigger, uh, both in absolute terms and in relation to our body size, as compared to most animals. And uh, that has uh, given us the unique urges, the unique aspirations to know the divine, to serve the divine uh, and uh, has pushed some of these basic instincts to the background and uh, given us the need for a great deal of regulation of these basic activities which remain essential but at the same time do not uh, are not expected to preoccupy us uh, with the preoccupy us the way they do in animals. So that little introduction, now we turn to the male reproductive system. The yes course and all other yes activities are a part of the celebrations of the 150th birth anniversary of Sri and the 75th anniversary of India's independence. Before we turn to the male reproductive system itself, uh, let's uh, look at the process of reproduction uh, as a whole. Now we have a large variety of cells in the body and uh, these are all different in their appearance. And uh, some of these now you have become familiar with and have been shown in this uh, picture. Uh, some of them have all these processes which improve the, increase the surface area. And uh, some of them are flattened like this so that there's hardly anything except the nucleus only a bit of cytoplasm so that uh, the thinness of these cells would allow transport across the linings uh, which uh, the of which the which constitute linings which are constituted by these thin cells as in the case of capillaries and uh, we shall see some more uh, cells of this type which are muscle cells and nerve cells and now the, all these cells look different and yet they are the same because each cell has a nucleus and that nucleus has the genetic blueprint which is exactly the same in each of these cells. So if the genetic blueprint, which is uh, supposed to control the way a cell looks and behaves, if that is the same, then why is it that these cells are so different in their appearance as well as in the way they function? That is because uh, although the genetic material is the same, the part of that genetic material which is expressed is different in each cell. Much of it remains repressed, that is hidden. It just remains a potentiality, but is not actually expressed. A small bit is expressed, and uh, the part that is expressed is different in each of these cells. And that is how these cells to come to have a different type of appearance as well as the way they function. Now let's look at this genetic blueprint a little more in detail. Uh, although most of the time the nucleus looks like a jumble of uh, in the nucleus, we can see this jumbled up mass, uh, which stains deep blue or purple with uh, the common stains. Uh, there are certain stages in the cell cycle uh, when uh, this material sorts itself out into more manageable uh, entities. And uh, these entities is what we call chromosomes. So these chromosomes are thread-like structures. and uh, they come in pairs. 
So we have in each cell 22 pairs plus another the 23rd pair. So in all, every human cell has 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. And out of all these pairs, the out of the pairs that we have, the 23 pairs, one came from the mother and one came from the father. And that's how we tend to have uh, characteristics, uh, some characteristics resembling more the mother and some more the father. And in turn, our mother and father got it from their parents and some of it continues to may get expressed in the grandchild rather than in the uh, parents. Uh, now, that is uh, how sort of we have this continuity, uh, which is ensured by these chromosomes. At the same time, diversity, because uh, uh, the chromosomes are, half of the chromosomes are coming from the mother and half from the father. Now, each of these chromosomes uh, encodes different characteristics and uh, each of these chromosomes encodes different characteristics and uh, but at the same time so far as the characters encoded by each member of the pair is concerned they are exactly the same now one came from the father and one from the mother now which is the character that will actually get expressed in general we can say that uh, one of these characteristics that is one which came from either the father or the mother tends to be dominant and uh, it's the dominant character that gets expressed and uh, the other one which is called recessive that is the submissive or the silent one which uh, does not get expressed now which is the character that is likely to be dominant again you know nature has uh, arranged this beautifully out of the two the one which is likely to have better survival value the one which is likely to give us a better health, that is the one that gets expressed and the one which is, uh, uh, which will give lead to characteristics which are less healthy, which encodes for less healthy characters, that will remain repressed. And, uh, but in some cases, there is no clear dominance and uh, what we end up expressing is something between the two, intermediate between the two. So this is, uh, uh, the way, I mean, we have these 22 pairs, but then the 23rd pair is a little different in men and women. In case of uh, women, the 23rd pair is also similar to these, and uh, these two chromosomes are called XX, that is, each of these is an X chromosome, but in men, there's only one X chromosome, and the other member of the pair is a much smaller one, and that is called the Y chromosome. So that is how these cells of uh, a man and a woman differ. Uh, the 22 pairs are comparable in both men and women, but the 23rd pair is different. Uh, in case of women, it consists of two X chromosomes. In a man, one X and one Y chromosome. Now, cell division is something which is uh, seen in all the cells because the cells are dying and they get replaced by uh, the remaining cells or precursor cells as a result of division. And uh, this division is such that uh, we get exactly the same type of daughter cells as compared to the cells which have died or which have to be replaced. So they have exactly the same number of chromosomes, the same type of chromosomes. It's, it's an exact duplicate and the same characteristics in appearance and behavior. And that is how we don't even come to know that this process is going on because uh, we tend to have the same number of cells, the same type of cells all the time. So those which are dying are just getting replaced and you don't even come to know. It's something like, you know, uh, uh, the car in which uh, something or the other may keep going wrong. And with the part which becomes unserviceable, we replace it with a new part. And the result is that over a period of 15 or 20 years, uh, almost all these uh, parts of the car might have been changed for new ones, but still the car looks essentially the same. Uh, and that's how we look essentially the same, but uh, uh, our cells are getting replaced and uh, uh, we don't have the same uh, cells continuing, except in a few organs where 
uh, the cells do not get replaced and the same cells continue to serve us throughout life. But by and large, uh, this type of a turnover of cells is going on all the time. And uh, the cells which are dying are getting replaced by exactly the same type of cells, same number of chromosomes, exactly the same type of chromosomes, same appearance, same function. However, in gonads, that is the sex organs, there are some cells in gonads. In gonads also, we have this type of cells too. But there are some cells in gonads which behave differently. These cells start in the same way with 46 chromosomes, but they go through a special process of division, which gives us two daughter cells in which only one member of each pair is present. And so these have 23 chromosomes each. And uh, these cells, which have 23 chromosomes each, are called the gametes. The male gamete is the sperm and the female gamete is the egg or the ovum. Now, it's easy to understand that uh, the gonadal cells which give rise to gametes, in case of women, the, gonadal, uh, uh, the gonad is the ovary. The ovary starts with certain cells which have, like any other cells in the body, 22 pairs of chromosomes plus another 23rd pair XX. Now, if this divides into two, in such a way that we have only one member of each pair present in the daughter cell. Then, uh, naturally, the, we'll have two daughter cells, each with 22 plus X and 22 plus X. And uh, this process is again sort of uh, random in the sense that uh, within these 22 also, some might have come from this woman's father and some from the mother. And the same would apply to this, which means there's a thorough reshuffling of the cards going on. And further, when this will combine with the male gamete, there'll be a further sort of a variation introduced. And that's how this is a sort of a reshuffling going on all the time, which gives us diversity as well as ensures better quality for the progeny by and large, because the best ones will tend to get selected. Uh, as we saw, the recessive characters are generally not as good as the dominant character. So a woman produces two types of, uh, two types of eggs, both similar, 22 plus X, 22 plus X, but within these 22, the two may not be exactly alike because some might have come from the father and some from the mother in this, and the same would be true of this. And the one which came from the father in this cell, corresponding to that, the chromosome in this would have come from the mother of the woman. So uh, there will be, so that is the only difference, but otherwise these are very similar eggs or gametes that the woman produces 22 plus X. In case of men, however, we saw that uh, we have 22 pairs of chromosomes, 22 pairs of ordinary chromosomes plus XY, the sex chromosomes, as they are called. And uh, therefore, the uh, gametes or the sperms that are produced will be of two different types. So from one precursor cell, one cell to start with, which gives us these um, sperms, one will get the X out of this and another sperm will get Y from this pair. So we have two types of sperms in e produced in equal number, uh, one with the, the X chromosome and another with the Y chromosome. Now let's look at uh, what happens when one egg unites with one sperm. So one egg or ovum, uh, when it unites with one sperm, there are these four combinations possible. Uh, let's start with uh, two eggs to start with. Uh, one precursor cell will give us two daughter cells, two eggs. And the same, uh, let's start with one precursor cell of the sperms, which will give us these two sperms when it has gone through the type of division which gives us only half the number of chromosomes, that is 23. Now, if this combines with this, we'll get 44 chromosomes plus XX. If, however, it combines with this type of a sperm, we'll get 44 plus XY, and this will then give us a boy. Uh, the same way this egg, when it combines with this, will give us 44 plus XX, a girl, and this one, 
44 plus y by a boy. And that's how, since the process is a random process, and these two types of sperms are produced in equal numbers, there is a, a, an equal pro probability of a child being a girl or a boy. Whether the baby will be a boy or a girl, therefore we can see, depends on the contribution that the ma man makes to the process. It is the man who is uh, producing these two different types of sperms and that is what is deciding whether the child will be a girl or a boy. So whether the baby will be a boy or a girl depends on the contribution that the man makes to the process. And therefore, if uh, somebody is particularly interested in getting a boy or a girl, don't blame the woman for it. Uh, it is the man's contribution that uh, determines whether the child will be a boy or a girl. Now let's look at the male reproductive system. Uh, this is the gonad, the testis, and uh, this leads to a, a set of tubular structures which then convey the products of this uh, testis, that is the sperms, through this tube. And uh, when it is about to reach the end, uh, we have these two glands, the seminal vesicles and the prostate, which add their secretions to what comes from the testes. And uh, then uh, you can see that it continues and uh, joins the urethra. Now, this is the urinary bladder and this is the urethra. So at this point, uh, Surrounded by the prostate is the place where this duct, which is a tube, which is bringing the products from the testis, uh, joins the uh, urethra, which is coming from the urinary bladder. After that, the passage for the urinary for the urine and the semen that is the uh, becomes common. And uh, this is a little clearer picture, although highly diagrammatic, and here you can see it more clearly, the testis and uh, the products of this accumulate into a coiled tube, the epididymis, and uh, from there it continues uh, into this tube called the vas deferens, and uh, then towards the end, we have the seminal vesicle, which can pour its secretions into the vas deferens, and the prostate which can also pour its secretions into this and uh, surrounded while it is surrounded by the prostate, it uh, joins the uh, urethra, which is coming from the urinary bladder and uh, then this common passage for both. This is uh, another view, the urinary bladder. And uh, these are the ureters entering the urinary bladder. And this is the duct coming from the testes. And uh, here you can see the seminal vesicles and the prostate. And uh, this would open into the urethra. Now, within the testis, we have a set of uh, structures which are called seminiferous tubules. Tubules which are because they are tube-like. Seminiferous because they give us uh, products which ultimately become the uh, semen. And uh, semini generally refers to something which can proliferate, like, you know, seminal production of something. So, uh, here because uh, they produce these sperms in large numbers, and their purpose also is eventually reproduction. So, seminiferous tubules. So, the, here are the seminiferous tubules, and uh, uh, as you can see, these are circular structures. But then, if you place large number of circular structures together in between, you'll be left with these spaces. These spaces uh, are filled with Leydig cells, or these spaces have Leydig cells or interstitial cells. Interstitial because what lies somewhere in some 
space in between like this surrounding the something. So that is generally referred to as interstitial. So these are interstitial cells or Leydig cells. And uh, these are the seminiferous tubules where the sperms are produced. Now this gives you a little uh, bigger view of the same. Uh, these are the Leydig cells in the Leydig cells in the interstitial space. Uh, this is a blood vessel in that interstitial space. And uh, within the tubule, you can see that uh, you have uh, these cells, which are the precursors of the sperms. As you go deep towards the cavity of the tubule, they keep maturing. And uh, then here you have uh, sperms, which actually look like sperms, now, although they are still not fully mature, but uh, they have started having the appearance of a sperm. But then you find that there are these big cells in which these uh, precursors, that is, uh, these cells which are developing into sperms, seem to be nestled. And these cells have processes. Now, these cells are called Sertoli cells. And uh, for a long time, we didn't know much about what they do. And it was thought they're just providing some sort of a mechanical support to these cells. But now we know that, in fact, they are very important and uh, extremely important. One can call them, instead of Sertoli cells, supervisory cells. They're supervising this entire process of uh, the precursor cells finally developing into the sperms and uh, making sure that before they get a send off from here, uh, they are well uh, equipped as well as reasonably disciplined. So the Sertoli cells are in fact uh, extremely important and we shall see a little more about them a little later. So you can see that in this seminiferous tubule, we have three types of cells. One, these cells which form the sperms Uh, these cells which form the sperms, uh, and here are the sperms. So you start with the most primitive cells here, and they keep maturing, and you have the cells here. Those which produce testosterone, the hormone, they are the Leydig cells or the interstitial cells here. And uh, the third category are the Sertoli cells here. So we have these three types of cells, and we shall have a little closer look at these one by one. These cells, one can understand, yes, uh, they are forming these sperms. How about the Sertoli cells? And these cells are producing testosterone. The Sertoli cells uh, is what we know a lot more about now than we did earlier. They may be providing some mechanical support, but probably that is the least important part of their role. Uh, one of the functions is that they provide nourishment to the these developing sperms. They take care of their nutrition because uh, there is no blood vessel that enters this area. Blood vessels do not enter this area because uh, blood could bring something which is toxic, uh, which uh, does not allow this process to happen properly. And uh, we want to provide the uh, nature has arranged for the cleanest possible environment for the development of these sperms so that their quality is not adversely affected by the type of environment to which they are exposed. So although I mean the blood environment is, provides an environment which is fairly well regulated, but still that regulation, that good environment which the blood provides to all cells of the body may not be good enough for these cells which receive special protection. So this seems to be an arrangement for special protection and uh, that is ensured by nourishment coming from the Sertoli cells, uh, which may get which are getting nourished by the blood, but then they would make sure that the, uh, they are able to pass on only the best environment to these developing cells. So they are sort of the supervisory cells, the nurturing cells for these um, cells which are developing into sperms. And uh, it is these cells which then also constitute the blood testis barrier. 
that is the barrier which does not allow blood to affect these cells. And how is that barrier ensured? Because these processes which are coming from here, uh, in fact, are so long that they come in contact with each other. And the junction between the uh, processes of the Sertoli cells is so tight that it does not let blood or anything that is oozing out of the blood influence, the, influence these cells. So there's a blood testis barrier, which also is constituted by the Sertoli cells. Then the Sertoli cells also manufacture a protein, the androgen binding protein. What it does is that it concentrates testosterone. The testosterone that is produced by these Leydig cells or the interstitial cells, all of it does not enter the bloodstream. You know, in general, hormones enter the bloodstream. They are not conveyed by a duct. But here, all some of the testosterone enters the bloodstream, and that leads to the generalized functions like uh, these, uh, like the development of secondary sex characters at puberty, or uh, the libido, the thoughts and influence on thoughts and feelings of a person. All that is because of this some to some testosterone getting into the blood, like any other hormone. But some of this testosterone just diffuses locally into this area, and uh, that will ensure a higher concentration than would be available from the blood. And since testosterone is required for uh, these uh, sperm precursors to develop into sperms, it's uh, an arrangement which is quite understandable that serving a useful purpose, providing a higher concentration than would be available in the blood. But then the concentration is further increased by the androgen binding protein, which is manufactured by the Sertoli cells. Androgen binding protein, as the name suggests, binds the androgens. Androgen, testosterone is the androgen. Andro, you know, refers to the male. So one which gives rise to male characteristics. So androgen. So androgen binding protein. So it binds testosterone. By binding testosterone, not leaving it free, it further ensures that a higher concentration of testosterone is built up. But then it doesn't just help in... Uh, uh, developing more and more sperms by creating a higher concentration of testosterone, uh, the production of sperms is also well regulated. It is regulated by negative feedback. Uh, testosterone is subject to that negative feedback. Uh, we shall see a little more of it again. But then there is also a negative feedback exerted through inhibin. Inhibin, as the name suggests, actually. Uh, inhibits the formation of sperms. So uh, this is a sort of a cell that uh, loves the cells which it is nurturing, but same time loves them with discipline. So love and discipline should go together uh, for the children, and that is what uh, the Sertoli cell seems to be doing. It's seeming to be playing a parental role for uh, the developing uh, sperms, and. Uh, We'll not talk too much about inhibin because we can understand the regulation and the feedback even without talking much about inhibin. But inhibin is an important hormone which again uh, exerts a negative feedback effect on the formation of these sperms. And finally, when the sperms have reached a level of uh, development and uh, parenting and schooling, whatever you may call it, uh, after they have reached that level, then the Sertoli cells also secrete a fluid which can push them off, which can send them away. Of course, there are cells which have uh, small, small cells, you see, which have been shown here, which have the characteristics of tiny muscles, which uh, lead to a contraction of uh, the, uh, say, the tubules. But then, along with the contraction, it would be also necessary to have some fluid to carry them. And that fluid also comes from the Sertoli cells. So the Sertoli cells take care of uh, these uh, in many ways and ensure that the right number, neither too many nor too few, of these sperms continue to be produced and uh, they get enough of testosterone by concentrating and yet not too much of it by producing inhibin. And uh, then finally, when these are ready, they give them a send-off. You know, they don't cling to these children, 
they give them a send off for embarking on a long journey. Long because uh, all the coil tubes and that we saw and the way the sperms will now travel is itself a pretty long and tortuous journey. So the regulation of uh, the function of the gonads or the testis is through negative feedback and uh, the product, we'll talk about only one product, testosterone produced by the Leydig cells or the interstitial cells. This feeds back primarily to the hypothalamus, to some extent also to the anterior pituitary and uh, The hypothalamus uh, produces the releasing hormone, the gonadotropin releasing hormone, and the hypothalamus itself is affected by melatonin, which is affected by stress, as we saw, and hypothalamus is affected by the thinking and the feeling part of the brain, and uh, therefore, uh, the hypothalamus is affected uh, both by melatonin, which in turn is affected by stress and uh, the duration of sleep, etc., so all these things, duration of sleep, quality of sleep, stress, thoughts and feelings through the hypothalamus will be able to affect reproductive function in the male as well. And the anterior pituitary in the male, as in the female, produces again both these hormones. LH, which in this case is called the interstitial cell stimulating hormone because it stimulates the interstitial cells which produce testosterone. And the second uh, hormone that is FSH, uh, which uh, in the women stimulates the follicles. Corresponding to that are the seminiferous tubules here, uh, the, which manufacture the sperms. So uh, corresponding to the two types of cells, that is the sperm producing cells and the testosterone producing cells, we have these two hormones coming from the anterior pituitary. FSH stimulating the formation of sperms and LH or ICSH stimulating the synthesis of testosterone. And both are subject to negative feedback. Uh, the production of testosterone primarily via this negative feedback to the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary and uh, FSH through the negative feedback produced by the Sertoli cells, the inhibin, which also has this negative feedback. So we have negative feedback on both sides uh, affecting the cells which manufacture the sperms as well as cells which manufacture testosterone. So two types of cells corresponding to that, two types of hormones from the anterior pituitary, but a single hormone from the hypothalamus regulating both. So that is the type of arrangement we have. So it's a fairly well-regulated production of sperms and testosterone. Now the product, the sperms as they are produced by the testis. It is uh, about 70 microns long of which the head is just about 5 microns long. So much of it is uh, the neck and the tail. The head essentially consists of the nucleus which carries the genetic material. But at the tip, it has the acrosome, which sort of uh, ensures the penetration. It has the equipment for making its passage through the female genital tract. So this is the sort of uh, the, like a spear, like an arrow, uh, which can penetrate. But it's not just because of its arrow-like shape. It's because it has those chemicals which can uh, dissolve uh, and create a passage, dissolve the uh, fluid on the way and create a passage. So that is what the acrosome is about. Acro, you know, means extreme. So it's at the extreme of the end. So that's why the acrosome. So this is the head. What about the neck? The neck has a very large number of mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of a cell. That's where the energy is generated. And this does require a lot of energy to swim through the female genital tract. So all the energy that is needed for the lashing of this tail so that it so that this little cell can swim uh, is provided by these mitochondria. 
So a small little head and a long tail to be able to swim. Uh, it's sometimes asked, you know, which is longer, the rat or its tail? And very often the answer we get it is the tail. And when a person says that the tail is longer than the rat, one forgets that the rat includes its tail. So the tail can never be longer than the rat, although it may seem so. And that applies to this also, which is longer, the tail of the sperm or the sperm. The sperm includes the tail. So naturally the sperm is longer, but then uh, the tail is really long. Now in one ejaculate, uh, the, the volume is about three to five ml. And each ml or milliliter has 100 million sperms. So four to 500 million sperms in each ejaculate. But then the important thing is for a person to be fertile, at least 80% of these should be normal. Normal in their structure, in their appearance. And the count should also be more than 40 million sperms per milliliter. So 100, you know, is uh, sort of the average. You know, in all these things, we don't have anything fixed, which is normal. There's a range of normals. But then if it is less than 40 million per milliliter, usually the person is not fertile. And uh, the trend these days is for uh, more of these abnormal cells as well as a lower sperm count. What the reasons are, whether it is uh, nutrition or whether it is radiation in the environment or whether it is stress, uh, all these things perhaps could be contributing, but the trend is towards reduced fertility. Now, the sperms as they are released from the testis are not really fully ready. They just received some elementary education in the testis from the Sertoli cells, but uh, they need further education in various schools and colleges. And uh, that is uh, what happens in this subsequent passage of these sperms before they are finally released. They acquire their motility and the ability to fertilize in the epididymis in 10 to 14 days. So this coiled tube, the epididymis, is uh, where they may stay uh, for a month or more. But out of that, about two weeks are required, in fact, for acquiring motility. Acquiring motility only means developing the capacity to uh, swim. They still actually don't swim. And uh, in fact, they do not swim till they have entered the, the female genital tract. Till then, they do not swim. They just keep improving their ability to swim. They keep acquiring this ability, which means they keep getting education, but they remain essentially unemployed. And uh, they become employable, gradually bet, uh, more eligible for employment as they go through all these areas, but they actually uh, start doing their job only when they're employed, and their employment means entering the female genital tract, and that is where they actually start swimming. So they acquire this ability to move and the ability to fertilize in about two weeks, and they may stay there for a month or more. But eventually, if uh, not called on to travel any further, they may degenerate and the epididymis can take care of the debris. It absorbs the degenerating sperms back. Now, from the epididymis, now, if the journey continues further, they move into the vast deference. And this is a long tube, as you can see. Uh, and they may stay here for months. It has a large storage capacity again. And for months, they may be there without moving. Uh, but uh, when called for, it can propel the sperms and push them further. And if not called upon, then the vast difference would just absorb them back like the epididymis, as the epididymis did. Now, the seminal vesicles. The seminal vesicles and prostate come into play only if uh, the semen is called forth and actually uh, goes out. It's only then that the seminal vesicles and the prostate become uh, useful and they start functioning. And uh, 
In fact, the seminal vesicles are important in many ways, but uh, one of the most striking and visible ways is they contribute is that they contribute 60% to the volume of the semen. And uh, this again is understandable because uh, uh, although there is plenty of storage space in the epididymis and the vas deferens, that space is used for uh, having as many spermatozoas, as many sperms as possible, packing them tightly. But when they have to go out, they need a larger amount of fluid to be pushed into the female genital tract. And therefore, that arrangement comes only towards the end of this in the seminal vesicles and the prostate, seminal vesicles contributing about 60% to the volume of the semen. And uh, further, what this seminal fluid from the seminal vesicles does is to protect the sperms against the acidic environment of the female genital tract and against germs which may be present there. It also has some nourishment uh, for these cells. Uh, fructose, vitamin C, etc. And it also has fibrinogen, uh, which uh, is the same type of protein which we have in the blood and leads to the formation of the blood clot. The semen also clots inside the female genital tract and therefore uh, the arrangement has been made for providing fibrinogen from the seminal vesicles and enzymes which will lead to the clotting from the prostate. So seminal vesicles provide the fibrinogen, prostate provides the clotting enzyme. And then this large volume also ensures that uh, the semen uh, will be washed off this and much of it will enter the female genital tract rather than remain in the passages. So with that push uh, with 60% of the volume uh, being contributed from here, the seminal vesicles are also contributing to washing of the semen uh, to this subsequent passage. How about the prostate, which everybody has heard of because of the enlarged prostate in uh, the elderly men? Prostate contributes 25% to the volume. So 60% from the seminal vesicles, 25% from here, hardly five, 10 to 15% from uh, the whatever was coming from the testes. And the prostate also adds to the nourishment. A part of the nourishment came from the Sertoli cells here. It also comes in the epididymis and the vast difference. But then the sperms get a send off from all these places. All these schools and colleges during the farewell provide them some more food uh, to carry along uh, the journey. So some nourishment, then enzymes for clotting and for dissolution of the clot. Uh, we'll come to this again, why this clot is necessary in the female genital tract and why then, of course, it needs to be dissolved. It needs to be dissolved to release the spermatozoa for further onward journey. Then the alkaline uh, prostate fluid is alkaline in nature, which neutralizes the acidic environment of the female genital tract. And one very important thing that the prostatic fluid does is that during ejaculation, it closes the opening between the bladder and the urethra. This opening here between the bladder and the urethra, this gets closed so that uh, the semen will not try to go up to the bladder. Even more important, the urine cannot be, will not flow down during ejaculation. So a person does not pass urine simultaneously, although the passage is common. During ejaculation, there's no passage of urine. So this is closed off. Uh, this is closed off by the prostatic fluid so that uh, without any contamination by the urine, the semen will pass through the tract. Now, how does uh, the semen actually get to its destination, uh, biological destination, that is uh, the female genital tract. This starts with the sex act, which uh, consists of arousal, uh, which uh, is the result of, which can be the result of uh, touch, as well as uh, the psychological influences, usually a combination of both. And uh, this leads to initially the erection of the penis. And this is a, a process that is uh, brought about by the activation of the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. 
we shall see about, uh, talk about that in a few days uh, but parasympathetic is that division which becomes active during rest and relaxation so this is a process that can take place only in a peaceful environment when a person is at rest and relaxed but then if the process has to continue further and uh, everything is appropriate for continuing that further then the next thing is emission and ejaculation that is emission that is uh, squeezing out uh, of uh, the semen uh, into subsequent passages and finally it's ejaculation out of the tract into the fem female tract and these are both carried out by the sympathetic nervous system now why this division of uh, two different divisions of the nervous system one can easily understand because uh, every arousal and erection does not necessarily have to lead to emission and ejaculation and also since this is brought about by the sympathetic the man is more excited at this point and uh, also uh, uh, it means that uh, after that excitement uh, the ejaculation uh, takes place and all this is over in about 19 seconds why somebody is emphasized 19 seconds perhaps to emphasize that's a, only a short lasting fleeting pleasure like all sensory pleasures it lasts only 19 seconds and uh, after that the man is feels exhausted because of the sympathetic uh, overdrive and tends to fall asleep and the sympathetic overdrive is also responsible sometimes for uh, a person may get a heart attack if the person is susceptible to it and that's why those who have heart disease are advised not to indulge in sex uh, unless they are sure about it so because uh, the sympathetic overdrive uh, is generalized in nature release of adrenaline uh, can impose additional burden on the heart Now let's look at the journey of the male gamete or the sperm after it has been ejaculated. The journey from uh, the point from where it leaves up to the egg is a 12 centimeter journey. And looking at the size of the 12 centimeter is uh, not long, but then looking at the size of the sperm, which is only 70 microns, one micron is only one thousandth of a millimeter. For this size, it is equivalent to a man or a woman swimming five miles upstream. And therefore, it's not surprising that out of 500 million, only a few hundred reach near the egg. And out of these 500, uh, only one actually penetrates the egg. Between the point where it is near the egg and the egg itself, again, there are a few layers to cross because the egg is surrounded by a some cells, the granulosa cells, and after that, there's a again a layer of uh, which they have to cross zona pellucida before it gets into the egg. So there are barriers to cross, and uh, there is a reduction in the number that is able to successfully get in at each point. Only a few hundred will meet near the egg, and at the final point when uh, penetration could be possible, only 20 or 30 are probably left. And out of these 20 or 30, one actually penetrates the egg. And after one has penetrated, the door is shut and another sperm cannot enter the same egg. All this uh, selection that is taking place at several stages, as you can see, uh, is probably not just a random process. It could be related to the quality of the sperms, which means it is the fittest and the strongest, and therefore the one which is likely to give the best child that actually makes it to the egg. Now, what happens in the female genital tract after the sperms have been deposited there? Uh, after entering the female genital tract, uh, the, uh, this uh, semen gets clotted and uh, in that are trapped the sperms. So it is here that the clotting takes place, uh, for which there was fibrinogen in the seminal vesicles and the clotting enzymes in the prostatic fluid. And uh, while they are trapped, they get exposed to the 
female genital tract environment. And this environment completes the process by which the capacity to swim can actually translate into action. Till now, it was only an ability that has been imparted, but it is in this, uh, during the stay in the female genital tract that uh, the possibility of actually translating this ability into action is acquired. And uh, you can say that now that the job has been given, uh, the final training takes place here in the female genital tract by which they can actually swim. And when that is over, then the clot dissolves and uh, then they are able to swim. Some swim faster than the others. And that is why out of several millions, it is only a few hundred which will get near the egg. Now this capacitation, that is acquiring the capacity to fertilize an egg by swimming needs at least one hour, but generally takes longer. And uh, the estimates vary, but it could be anything from 12 to 24 hours before the uh, sperms actually start swimming towards the egg. So now you can see that uh, uh, while I mean in the, so much work had been done in the male genital tract before the semen is deposited, it finally takes some contribution by the woman to give them the capacity to swim, to give them the capacity to penetrate, and then only they are able to do it. And uh, therefore, the female contribution is not just the egg, but also uh, making the uh, making fertilization possible by imparting to the sperms in the semen the actual final capacity to swim, translate this potential, this latent ability into action and to be able to penetrate the eggs. So that contribution of the woman is important. Uh, once a class, uh, in an English language class, was given this sentence to punctuate. You know, we often get these sentences with without any punctuation and uh, without any capitals. And then the student is expected to uh, punctuate it. And uh, the idea is to uh, show the students not only how to punctuate a sentence, but also the importance of punctuation because uh, uh, punctuation can bring out the meaning, whereas without punctuation, the sentence may not make much of sense. So the sent line given us, woman without her man is incomplete. Now, most of the students in the class punctuated it like this, woman without her man is incomplete. Now, the girls in the class were naturally not very happy completing it like this, but then if I had to get uh, marks for this question, this was the only way they thought they could complete it, and so they did it like this. But there's one smart girl in the class, and this is what she did. Woman, without her, man is incomplete. So now this is the journey that uh, the sperms have to make from point A to point B. And it is this 12 centimeter long journey, which is equivalent to a five mile swim upstream. There are a few lines from Savitri, from Sri Savitri. And uh, the context is that uh, Satyavan and Savitri have got married. But uh, Savitri knows, and nobody else knows, nobody at least uh, in her new family knows, her husband doesn't know, his parents don't know, that uh, Satyavan was to live for only one more year. And uh, because, of, because she knew this, at the same time, this is something she did not want to share with anybody. Uh, she was extremely passionate in her love for Satyavan and uh, was counting days how long this uh, bliss will last. All the same, she also started practicing her yoga so that uh, she would acquire those abilities, which will those powers which will enable her to bring Satyavan back from death and that she succeeded in doing. Uh, now, while she was uh, for one year with Satyavan for one year, she was extremely passionate in her love and these are a few lines out of many such passages uh, where Sri Aurobindo has talked about the bliss of uh, union. 
which is uh, not only physical but also at the spiritual level. A fusing of the joys of earth and heaven, a tremulous blaze of nuptial rapture past, a rushing of two spirits to be one, the burning of two bodies in one flame. Opened were gates of unforgettable bliss, two lives were locked within an earthly heaven, and fate and grief fled from that fiery hour. So, it's a sort of a fusion of uh, joys of earth and heaven. Joys of the earth and joys of heaven both rolled into one joy, and one can understand how much that joy would be if you add to the joys of earth also those of heaven. A tremulous blaze of nuptial rapture passed. A rushing of two spirits to be one. So the union is both physical and at the level of the spirit. A burning of two bodies in one flame. So the bodies are two, but the consuming passion, the passion of uh, love is one. Opened were gates of unforgettable bliss. Two lives were locked within an earthly heaven. Two lives, two bodies, but uh, locked as if they were one. And fate and grief fled from that fiery hour. This hour could be the hour of uh, the hour in the bed, or it could be. Uh, only a figurative uh, sort of way of looking at that short period of one year during which they were supposed to be together. But while they were together, fate didn't bother them, although she knew what the fate was, what fate was like. Fate was cruel. She was going to be Satyavan for one more, for just one more, one year in all. And uh, grief, uh, the bliss overwhelmed all grief to such an extent that grief also fled from that fiery hour. And the anatomical pictures in this presentation were taken as in the others from Tortora and Grabowski's Principles of Anatomy and Physiology. Gratitude to the mother and Sri for making these sessions possible. And a big thank you to all the fathers of the world. This can be a good time for closing with all the wisdom which you have shared. So we can just have a few moments of silence and end today's class. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.